Hey everyone, Mario here, jumping in at the start of this episode. Uh, just want to give a fair warning, there is some rough audio in this week's episode. We had some minor technical difficulties while both recording and editing this episode uh, with multiple audio failures and backup not working the way that it should. So there are parts that may sound a little disjointed or like an old-timey radio. Uh, you'll have to bear with them. I think this one is definitely worth listening to despite the challenges that we faced with the audio. We do have a fun topic for you guys this week and uh, for everyone listening, I hope you do enjoy our history of Bob Gurr. So that said, on to the episode. Give me a little intro there, Gomer. <laughs> You're listening to the Station 71 podcast. My name is Mario, and this week I'm joined by my co-hosts, Beth and Brian. So this week we've got another history episode. Super excited about this one. Uh, Brian has thrown together a, well, that sounds horrible. Brian has put together a history. <laughs> on, um, He's worked really hard on a history. Yeah, there you as go. As he always does. Yeah, thank you. Throw some respect <laughs> on it, man. <laughs> Uh, but first, let's dive into the news topics this week. Um, so first up, we have some harmonious news. Uh, both of these news stories kind of tie together. Looks like they're going to begin testing harmonious stuff uh, on World Showcase Lagoon at Epcot. And with that, we've got some news that the barges will actually be permanent fixtures in World Showcase Lagoon and will function as daytime fountains. Hmm. What do you guys think about these? I think it looks cool from the concept art. I just hope it doesn't look stupid from the back of World Showcase. Because this concept art is from the front, right? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, like, in my mind, when you think about, like, this World Showcase Lagoon was kind of there to be the nighttime spectacular show, but it's really a pretty huge body of water that really has nothing going on with it during the day so i mean right. i guess this is kind of a cool way to use that space and not have it solely be set aside for the nighttime show i am interested to see what they do if they did it kind of like how they had the uh the fountains of nations that would be pretty cool because it's kind of like just a random oh yeah here's some music and then you know some fountains going off every now and then from the looks of it from this article, it just kind of is going to be running during the day, which is also interesting. I don't know. I think it'll freshen up Epcot a little bit, which will be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of hope that there's not a thing like you said, because I feel like that <laughs> would be really hard to. It would be really hard to put something in the middle of World Showcase with music that doesn't distract too much from the ambiance of each pavilion i guess that's fair what if it wasn't like music and it was just like water fountain fount yeah like the fountain That'd effects went cool. off i wouldn't mind that like that i said be. i just hope that it doesn't look only cool from this one angle <laughs> so next thing we've got on here is that disney has fast-tracked the development of the princess and the frog overhaul for splash mountain Oof. which yeah, that's exactly how I felt when I read this. At first, I was like, oh, look, they're still going with it. And I went, wait, fast track is not a good word. Mm -mm. No, I hope that they don't sacrifice quality for timeliness. Same. So my question to you guys with that is, which animatronic do we think is going to get skinned and overlaid for the Tiana animatronic? Oh, <laughs> are any of them going to work for that? No, nope. <laughs> they're going to have to make a new one. I sure hope so. No, I, I don't was... understand how they're how they will fast track this. Like the even the exterior, I feel like is going to take a ton of work. No. And the I mean, 
Splash Mountain is a long ride. Like mm-hmm. it just in the length of it and the time it takes up, this is definitely not an attraction to be fast tracked and not have a full effort put into. Uh yeah, I feel like a lot of people who don't ride Splash or have never ridden Splash don't realize that the drop is literally five seconds of the attraction. It's not the attraction itself. Like, yeah, yeah that's like the, the climax of it. And it's like, ah, oh, this big drop and it's crazy adrenaline rush. Woohoo. But the rest of the attraction is just, it's like you said, it's a very lengthy attraction. And honestly, the drop is my least favorite part. Yeah. I mean, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Splash Mountain is like over a 10 minute runtime or very close to it, which is like an eternity and an attraction time. So, yeah. Uh, Looks like it's 11 minutes and 45 seconds. Wow. Yeah, that's super, like, you you can really tell which attractions, uh, were are the oldest based on how long they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh that's absolutely true. Well I guess Meanwhile, uh, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train two and a half minutes. If that ride was longer Ellen's energy adventure. Oh well, gosh, yeah. God. yeah, there's def- remember... there's definitely a sweet spot of <laughs> being a long attraction and being a good attraction. I remember when me and Jordan went in college and we were at Epcot and we went to go get on that and they had this sign up that was like hey just so everybody knows like this is a 40 minute attraction and I was like 40 minutes mm. like yeah it's uh ooh, that was that was a bit too much yeah um I don't know how I feel about this though I feel like it's I I want it, like you said, Beth, I want them to not sacrifice the quality of this attraction for the time, like turnaround time on it. That's the only thing that I hope that doesn't come from this. I think it will be a huge, huge shame if they do, because not only are you taking an attraction that is absolutely beloved by the community and changing it, which already has shown a lot of, you know, pushback. But you're also taking a character. What this is probably one of the first attractions that has a minority as the star. Yeah. Right. Maybe not one of the first, but it's. I mean, it's a big deal because Tiana's never had an attraction before, and they're giving her one. And if they screw it up, there's going to be a lot of ill will. I feel like. Mm Hmm. Especially given what it's replacing. So Right. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I'm I'm hoping when they say they're fast tracking that, that means they're like putting everybody on this project. Well, my other thought too is that maybe they're allocating um workforce from other projects to this one. So not like necessarily putting all of their tasking on this, but instead maybe like you know, if if something else was a priority, they've shifted it here instead of just like, let's get this out as quick as possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe all those attractions that have gotten canceled because of coronavirus, they can reallocate those people that were supposed so- to work on that. Hmm. So next news that we have one here is one I'm intrigued about more so than excited uh park hopping is going to return to walt disney world with modifications so starting the first of next year uh guests that have purchased tickets or have annual passes will be able to park hop now uh basically how it's going to work is you're going to reserve your first park you'll have to show up and then you'll have hours in which you can park hop so like the example that they gave was you can book your Magic Kingdom ticket in the morning, stay at Magic Kingdom until around 2, and then at 2, you can hop to whatever park you want. I understand how this is going to help because the whole point is trying to like reduce capacity, right? And if you don't know how many people are going to be in a park after 2 p.m., 
then why do you why even have the park reservation system anymore? Well, so um, am I reading this correct? Would you still have to reserve the second park that you're hopping to? No, no, just the first oh. one. Yeah. Oh, I see. Which is. No, okay. Huh. Which is what confuses me about the whole situation. Yeah, that's it's like right I... now, the only park I feel like that's people are stressing out about getting a reservation for not during holiday times is Hollywood Studios. So what's to stop people? I mean, I guess the only thing that would really deter people from park hopping to Hollywood Studios is if they were going just to ride Rise of the Resistance, because if it starts at two, that's when the last the second boarding pass call goes on and they'll have missed their opportunities but if you don't care about that then what i just feel like it's going to make hollywood studios like crazy crowded if I, like the way that they're setting this up probably i'm wondering if like there's data that shows that maybe people aren't staying the full day i don't know i mean you've been there beth did it feel like the entire day was like the parks were crowded or at the same capacity well, see, the thing is, when I went, it was before they increased the capacity, and I feel like also demand was lower. Like, the word mm -hmm. hadn't quite gotten out that Disney parks feel super safe to be in during coronavirus. So, it didn't feel super crowded to me, and I got there at, like, 8.30 in the morning, and by 3 o'clock, I felt like I had done everything I wanted to do, and I left. So, it's possible that that data is lining up, that they're seeing, like, oh, people get everything they want to do done by 2 o'clock or shortly after, and then they leave, so then it'll free up space. But I feel like the more people hear about how safe people have been feeling at the parks and the more that they keep increasing capacity, it's just going to, it's just setting it up to be like more and more crowded as time goes on. Yeah. But I also think that, I mean, I would hope that Disney would roll back on the restrictions, but I don't think they will. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. I also want to know, like, you reserve your first park, then at 2 o'clock you can go to another park. Can you then, if you just want to go grab food at Epcot and then go to Hollywood Studios, can you go to a third park? Could you do all four parks in one day still? From my understanding, I think you could only do two, but I don't know how they would stop you from doing that. Right. So, I mean, are would they still... I, I would assume they would still have a maximum capacity that they would not, you know, let you go over. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's true, is that you take the chance. If you leave one park to go to another, you take the chance of that park already having reached capacity. And then not being able to get into it. So maybe that's why they're not. Well, I don't know. If they required the reservation for all the parks that you were going to, there's not any repercussions for booking a park and then not going. So I guess that would kind of make it null anyway. Yeah. People just true. booking just because they think they might go. I don't know. This is, it's just as weird that you still have to book the first one to me. If you're going to incorporate this, I just feel like you just take the park pass reservation system out completely. Or have to book both of them. That's I think that's the only way that you can do it is it's not one and then whatever. It's one end or neither system. Yeah. I don't know. I guess yeah. we'll see in January. <laughs> I what think you say, right there, you, you'd have to do it as a like reserve both days. Cause could you imagine not having the reservation system right now? If you came down from out of state somewhere for a week to stay at Disney and you didn't get into the parks, like one of those days because they weren't doing the reservation system and just had a max capacity, like people would be lined up with pitchforks and torches <laughs> if they had gone on vacation and not been able to go to the parks. Yeah. I just have a feeling that January 1st is going to be a uh I don't want to say a thing that you're going to exactly have to censor. It's going to be a bad time for a lot of people. 
And we're going to get to all witness that happening until they figure out how to make this work effectively. <laughs> yeah, that's what my fear is, too. I mean, we're, we're going down in March and uh, cautiously optimistic that the kinks are going to be worked out of this. But I don't have a lot of faith. Have a lot more optimism than I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, last news story that we have, I I don't know how to preface this, but if you're missing the Osborne lights, you can find them now at Give Kids the World. <laughs> um, so Night of a Million Lights is an attraction that Give Kids the World is putting on. Um, it's an 89 acre. Um, I think that's the full size of their resort illuminated spectacle. Uh, a la Osborne Lights. So yeah. mm -hmm. this is nice. Um, I believe some of the lights actually came from there, if I was reading this correctly. Um, it says Disney World provided the vast majority of the lights, over 3 million in total. So I'm which, not sure if they specifically came from the Osborne Lights, but I would I would guess that a big chunk of them did. Yeah. Well, it says the next line is... Uh, not only due to the donation of the Christmas lights purchased years ago for a canceled Osborne lights display that really just like hurt my heart to read. Um, but, but yeah, it's good to see it living on. And especially at as great of a place as give kids the world. is. Yeah. That, that was my takeaway from it too, is like, I think this is a good spot for it to live on. It's good for, Oh yeah. Some of this stuff is definitely from Osborne lights just looking at the pictures. Um, but anyway, it goes to a good cause. The donations are going to give kids the world, or the, the ticket price is going to give kids the world. So that's great. And we've talked before about how good of a, a mm -hmm. organization they are. Yeah. I mean, anytime they come up, I'll, you know, I have to give them a plug. They're a great, great organization. Um, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure that they're not, currently back up and running which means that they're not accepting volunteers right now to my knowledge um but if you're planning a trip in the future and you have a a break day or you're doing some time in orlando doing something else um i would highly 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 suggest just take a day or a half day out of your time even uh book some res some volunteer time at give kids the world and go in there it's a really really super rewarding and honestly just really fun experience to do um we've done it a couple times and it's just it's really great um just you know they're they're really doing great stuff at this charity and it's it's very very cool to see that the setup they have there so if you get a chance if you have free time please 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 go volunteer give kids the world when they're back up and operating yeah, I, after hearing about this, would love to, on my trip in a few weeks, try and take a night off and do this. Because I didn't realize how huge this uh, resort was. And also that all of the little villas have, like, different themes and different sponsors. Mm -hmm. And all of them are so, like, well-decorated and have such mm -hmm. cool little themes. You know, you got, obviously, Disney sponsored a couple, SeaWorld. Uh, probably Universal somewhere, but then you also have like Ripley's Believe It or Not, and their little gingerbread people are like oddities, like two-headed <laughs> gingerbread man. Like all of this stuff is just so cool and cute to look at. I I really hope we can we can squeeze it into our trip. Hopefully it's uh it's open and you can. That I would love to hear about your experience with it too. Well. That said, that's going to bring us to our topic this week. So I will turn it over to Brian for our history lesson. All right. So um, everybody remembers the Walt bio that I did that turned into a, what was it, six episode over a couple months thing. The original idea before we were even going to do that was we wanted to take a look at different iconic Imagineers that have worked 
at Walt Disney Imagineering over the years. And that kind of spun off into, oh, well, before we do that, we have to do like a Walt bio first because he was like the original Imagineer. And that obviously took up so much time. I think this topic got suggested probably at least a year and a half ago. And I finally got the Walt bio knocked out after a very lengthy amount of time. And I was very excited because that meant that we got to move on to this. So um, I was looking and I was trying to decide what Imagineer I wanted to do first. And um, I decided to do, I think, probably my favorite Imagineer, who is Bob Gurr, to start off this this new series. Um, so if you don't know Bob Gurr, you should. Um, I would say over the years, the title of Disney legend has been bestowed on the people that were able to bring the ideas of Walt Disney to life. And to convey life, you have to be able to convey motion. And I don't think anybody has done a better job at that than Bob Gurr. Uh, over his career with WED and Disney Imagineering, Gurr worked on over a hundred projects, mainly focused on transportation, ride systems, or just movement in general. And according to Bob himself, if it moves on wheels at Disneyland, I probably designed it. And that's really not that far of a stretch of the truth. <laughs> he has done so much stuff, not even just at Walt Disney and the parks, um, but over a lot of different places and just in theme park ride systems in general. He really was a pioneer for a lot of stuff. So I thought he would be the perfect person to kick off the series with. I agree. I'm very <laughs> excited to see how this plays out. Cool, cool. So one thing, too, that I really enjoyed about doing the research with um, with Bob Gurr was I saw so many parallels with him and Walt Disney just in this kind of, like, you hear stories about them as a kid, and you it's like it's so easy to see the people that they grew up to become and, and the legacies they left behind. Like you hear the stories about them, just kind of like how, you know, like Walt growing up in Marceline, you see the impact on him. It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Like Bob Gurr is the same. Um, it was cool. Like listening to some of the stories of him as a kid, he he had a very mechanical mindset. Um, and one of the things that he was really really big into that you see come back a lot in his later work was that he loved loved cars, he loved automobiles, and um, he said that, you know, if you look back at his, like, his notes or any of his school books from when he was a kid, like, all the margins of the paper were just lined with him, like, doing sketches of, of cars that he was just designing different ones. And it reminded me so much of, you know, Walt doing the same thing, like, not being able to focus on school and sketching in his books all the time, too. And, like, whereas Walt kind of took that to become an artist, uh, Bob Gurr took it to become, you know, a, an industrial designer. And, an Imagineer, and it was just really cool to see those parallels. Um, the other thing, too, the other funny story about Bob Gurr was that uh, he grew up in Glendale near the Grand Central Air Terminal, and apparently there was a hole in the fence that he would sneak into after hours, and he would actually, like, sneak into the plane cockpits to, like, look around and explore them and check all the, you know, like, the controls and everything on them. And I thought, that's cool. That's really awesome that, you know, he was that into it. And it also painted a picture of how different and innocent the times were back then <laughs> because i'm pretty sure that would get you put on a no-fly list nowadays or arrested yes most likely arrested as well uh, but this curiosity really carried through with his young life and even into his early adulthood he went to the art center college of design in la um, and got his degree in industrial design um, so after he graduated in 1952, he went on to work at General Motors for a short time. But he didn't stay there very long. He quit not, uh, or pretty soon after starting work there and decided to open up his own industrial design company. So this is during um, the early 50s, and we know that uh, Wed and Walt were underway in designing attractions for the upcoming Disneyland Park. 
Um, the other thing that was going on in the early 50s at this time was that the highway systems in America, uh, you know, where they were, one, very different than they are today, much smaller roads. Um, <laughs> that was about to change. Uh, President Eisenhower, uh, this was cool. I didn't really know, that, or I wouldn't say cool. This is interesting. I didn't know that this was the reason why this happened, but uh, President Eisenhower was fearing a future nuclear attack and wanted there to be a way for mass transportation of people across the country if that were to happen. So because of that, him and his cabinet began working on the interstate highway legislation, which would open up uh, a number of multi-lane highways across the country in order to make that possible if it needed to happen. Um, obviously, aside from having a, you know, a huge evacuation route in the event of an emergency, um, this was also going to really change the way American transportation occurred during the time. You know, uh, you saw after or before this, you know, people mainly living very close to where they worked and, uh, and you know, the onset of the um, highway legislation really opened up commuting and just people driving longer distances and traveling more. Um, so really changed the way that Americans traveled. Wow. And, yeah. Uh, and so Walt saw this and said, hey, this is, you know, this is kind of the future of transportation in America. We need to do something in relation to this in the park. So the attraction that Wed came up with was called Autopia, which uh, um, people that don't know or aren't as familiar with Disneyland, it's kind of the Tomorrowland Speedway, um, <laughs> but the original one in Disneyland. Um, so it was a small winding track that guests would be able to drive miniature cars on. However, though, um, remember at this time, a lot of the team that was working at WED were not really engineers. They were artists. They were cartoonists. Other people, very creative people that worked at you know Walt Disney Studios that he brought over to the Imagineering team. But they didn't have a whole lot of technical knowledge. Um, so while they were coming up with these good ideas, Walt <laughs> realized, hey, we need to bring in people that kind of have more of an engineering background. So Walt was looking at people outside the company to bring in on kind of like a consulting um, and contracting position. So at this point, this is when he found Bob Gurr, um, who was working in his own design company, and he hired Gurr on like a contract basis to come in and help them design the Autopia cars. And uh, Gurr only worked there a short amount of time before Walt was so impressed that he offered him a full-time job to come work at WED, and Gurr obviously accepted. Um, if you ever get a chance, there is a really cool Google Talk interview that Bob Gurr did a couple years ago. And one of the things that he talked about, or that he was asked a question about at this time, was what was the the process like for designing rides at Disney during this time, like in the early days? And it was really cool because his answer was basically there was no process. You know, so much of the stuff that they were doing, there was no there was no like basis to work on that came before it. Most of the stuff they were doing, they were coming up with completely new concepts. They he said, you know, there was no theme park 101 that you took and you knew how to do this. There was no laid out development process for, oh, you know, we come up with a presentation and we present it to the board and they reject or approve and then we have all this. Other. It's like, no, it was, you go in there, you kind of throw something together and you hope it works. And if it doesn't, you go back, you fix it, you try something else again and see if it works. It was a very very iterative process and um that was so so very true with the development of the autopia cars and i love like how that connected to this um so they begin designing the prototype cars for autopia and as I'm sure anybody that's been to, not even um, like Tomorrowland Speedway or Autopia, anybody that's been to one of these kind of like uh, car on the track type attractions kind of knows how it goes. There's the like bumpers around, you know, around the wheels and the body of the car. And so if you run anything, it just kind of bounces off of them and stuff. 
So the concept or the prototype cars did not have that. And oh, so, that sounds dangerous. It very so they built a number of these prototype cars to test them out on the track, um, and before the they were even close to opening Disneyland, all of the prototype cars that they had built had just been completely destroyed, and they had to go back to the drawing board and come up with something new. Um, also, to keep in mind at this time, not only did the cars not have the bumpers protecting them, the track didn't have the guardrail thing in the middle that kept you on the track. They were It was literally just like an open road with cars on it. There was uh. there was nothing to keep guests on the track. So, anyways, before they open up the park, Bob Gurr and the team go back and they add the protective uh, little bumpers around the wheels and and the um, and the frames of the car, and it does help a bit. At least it made it to opening day this time. You don't sound so <laughs> confident in saying that. <laughs> so, so the Mark One cars they open up with. In 1955 with the opening of Disneyland and they like they lasted longer than the prototype cars but they didn't do much better than that um, th- just to give you an idea the cars got abused so much that by 1958 the team was on the fourth generation of the Autopia car so oh three years gosh. after they opened they've had to completely go back and redesign these cars three times just from when the parks open um and it was it was bad it was funny um there's this story that girl was talking about in another interview where he basically came up to Walt and was like hey we have no way to work on these cars like they they didn't have a like garage or anything to work on the car so uh Kerr was like hey i need a i need a, a like an actual building so he said that walt had a tractor pull up like a mobile garage like the very next day and the driver said here's your damn garage and dropped it off to Gur. and they finally had like an autopia garage to work on these cars that were just getting beat to hell over the years oh my god <laughs> So um, they were trying to come up with new ideas. The fifth generation cars came out shortly after that, um, and they had updated bodies, but really they were still just getting absolutely destroyed. And by 1964, they came out with the sixth generation, and they finally decided that they had to do something better with the ride system to make it where people weren't destroying these cars because i mean obviously they were driving off the track they were even they were say it, was, it wasn't uncommon for cast members to get hit they were operating the attraction so it was just very dangerous very expensive to keep this up so in 1964 when they debuted the sixth generation of the autopia cars <laughs> they finally added the center rail that ran down the middle of the track to keep you from running off of it um, and it was extremely, extremely successful in doing what they wanted. Uh, it sounds like I, it should have been an earlier edition. <laughs> it most certainly should have been. It's crazy to me to think that this attraction existed in the state that it did on opening day. But there's a ton of crazy attractions at Disneyland on opening day. If you ever see the one with the boats, dude, they had basically Autopia but with boats. And it was literally people who were able to just drive around on this, like boat with track like made in the rocks it was oh it it was very action parky yeah um so in 1967 they updated the cars one more time and this was really just a cosmetic change because they wanted the bodies to look like corvette stingrays and just to let you know how (laughs) how well this works so from 1955 to 1967 They've been through seven generations of cars to try to get them where they're not getting destroyed. Um, And from 1967, when they finally updated to this new body style and they added this center rail, that version of the car lasted all the way up until 1999. So it was extremely effective, and like Mario said, they really probably should have had that from the get-go. But... uh, Autopia itself was extremely, extremely popular, um, 
and that was mainly due to the work that Bob Gurr did on that. The attraction was so popular that in 1956 and 1957, two more Autopia attractions were open at Disneyland in separate areas of the park. So, which I'll, I, I wish or I hope I'll be able to go to Disneyland someday and experience Autopia, but all I can compare it to is Tomorrowland Speedway. And I think of how awful it would be if there were multiple Tomorrowland Speedways in Disney World. <laughs> No, thank you. So over the next couple of years, this is when if you listen to our past history episodes, you know that Disneyland is going through an expansion phase. And um, they, uh, the parks have also already ran into the Tomorrowland problem in that the technology of the day was catching up with what was in the park and guests were becoming bored with the attractions that were there. Ah, so, the common Disney problem. Yes, it's funny how prevalent that has been since the opening of Disneyland, and we still run into it today. <laughs> um, but Walt wants to continue this focus on transportation and as well as looking towards the future. Um, so he and Wed come up with three more attractions that will kind of accomplish this and also give just more attractions in general to Disneyland to help kind of, you know, spread guests out. And these are the Matterhorn bobsleds, the monorail, and the submarine voyage attractions. These were all set to be open in June of 1959, and he tasked all of them to Bob Gurr. So... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so the first one is Submarine Voyage, and this one was a particular challenge for Gurr and the team. Uh, even though the ride vehicles themselves didn't actually fully submerge underwater, the guests did sit below water level and looked out through portholes. And the issue that they had was that they needed to design the attraction so that it really sold the illusion that guests were diving underwater, um, and that, you know, they weren't actually sticking up above the water at the top of the beach. <laughs> um, and really a big part of how they were able to do that and not, like, be able to see the track was the way that Bob Gurr designed the vehicles and designed the ride track um, to sell that illusion. Um, and another thing that I didn't know was... The Submarine Voyage was, I guess for its time, actually a pretty good people eater. I didn't realize how big the submarines themselves were. They said that they would fit 40 guests on each one of those. So it's pretty cool. It always seems so much smaller in the videos I see. So um, during the 50s, Walt uh, also traveled to Europe quite a bit and during one of his trips to Germany, he got to ride on a new form of transportation that combined his love of trains and the future, and that was what was called an Allweg monorail. Um, and this is was pretty similar to the monorails that we know and love at the parks today. Um, had an elevated rail and you know the sleek design that we kind of know that the vehicles did look a little bit different than the. Um, the monorails that we see in the park today. Uh, but Walt saw it, and he knew that Disneyland needed one, too. <laughs> so he um, he came back and had shown Bob Gurr pictures of, of the different designs. There was the um, the popular one, the Allweg monorail that he rode on, was the, the same, very similar system to what we see with the elevated track and the train on top of it. But there were also a number of other what they still refer to as monorails throughout Europe that people use for transportation. And another one was kind of an inverse design where the rail was above the train system and the, um, the car kind of hung down from it. And this was the original concept that Walt actually brought back and pitched to Bob Gurr and said, hey, this is the, the monorail that I want to put in the park and Bob Gurr told him that it looked like a piece of or a loaf of bread being suspended from a rail and that it would look awful in the park and there was no way that he could design it to fit in with uh, Tomorrowland and it look futuristic at all. Harsh. So Bob, yeah. 
somebody's got to tell them how it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Bob Gurr took and uh, went back to something a lot more similar to the Allweg design and went again with a an elevated rail but had the train on top of the monorail. Uh, but he also wanted to tweak Allweg's design because he didn't think that it really looked futuristic enough. It still kind of looked just like a blocky train that was on top of this monorail. So he designed, you know, the sleek, very, very um, like contoured and angled front of the monorail that we know today. The monorail's obviously gone through a couple of changes over the years, but really the overall shape of the monorail uh, is based off of Gurr's initial design. Uh, Gurr also did the uh, the little the part of the monorail that kind of hooks around the rail so that as the train goes by, it you know it covers up the rail and it just helps make it look more sleek and futuristic. Uh, but it also helped increase the efficiency of the monorail. And the monorail at Disneyland was actually far more efficient than the Allweg monorail in Germany that is used for like legitimate transportation of passengers, <laughs> which is pretty interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Gurr is working on this design and just like everything that happened at Disney Imagineering from like, f- you know, the early fifties up until hell, it's probably still kind of going on today is that the things didn't get finished until the last minute. Yep. And <laughs> to put this into perspective, the um, the opening day of the unveiling of this new expansion to Tomorrowland was going to occur on June fourteenth. The monorail did not make a entire successful loop around the Tomorrowland track until June thirteenth, the day before they were unveiling it. Wow. Yeah, so they were really pushing it close. And to um, make matters even more stressful, to help promote the new attraction, then Vice President Richard Nixon and his family were going to attend the ribbon cutting ceremony and take a ride on the newly christened monorail. (laughs) And after all these issues that they've run into and the delay to construction and getting it up and running, um, Walt had this team of trained monorail operators ready to go, but he, at the last minute, decided that he didn't trust anybody else other than Bob Gurr to operate these, especially to, um, you know, drive Vice President Richard Nixon. So he had a uniform made up really quick for Bob Gurr, and Bob Gurr was the one that actually operated the monorail. Uh, for Richard Nixon and his family on opening day for the unveiling. So we've seen what Bob Gurr has done with Submarine Voyage and the monorail, and these were both you know, two attractions that were Walt really focusing on transportation in the future. Um, but he was also looking towards the future of just amusement and you know, theme parks in general. And probably the, the most notable attraction from this time that Bob Gurr worked on was the Matter, Matterhorn bobsleds. Um, this was Disney's answer to thrill seekers that were visiting the park, and it was the first roller coaster that was built at Disneyland. Um, and just kind of like how amusement parks in general were something that Walt saw as like a fun thing, but had a, you know, a slew of issues with them. Um, you know, he wanted to do the same thing with roller coasters. So he wants to bring in a roller coaster, but at this time, roller coasters were wooden construction, and back in this day, they were like they were wooden construction, not like steel track wood roller coasters that we see today. I mean, they were wood frame, wood track roller coasters, which meant they were extremely jerky and rough and jarring, and he knew that that was not going to fit in his park. So. He goes to Bob Gurr and says, I need you to come up with something better. And Bob Gurr starts off and designs the very iconic bobsled ride vehicles, but probably more importantly was the ride system that he created. Uh, And this was something that I didn't know either until doing this research, but 
Bob Gurr came up with and designed the continuous tubular roller coaster system, which is pretty much the standard of what roller coasters even to this day are built on. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So even if you're not a big Disney fan, if you're just someone that likes roller coasters, like Bob Gurr is like the guy, like, I don't know where roller coaster technology would be today if he hadn't come up with this ride system. Pretty cool. So yeah, the, um, you know, anybody that doesn't know, it's not big into roller coasters, but before then you literally had like wheels running on a wooden track and there was, you know, the ride experience was basically as good as however well, you know, the, how smooth the wood and <laughs> wheel interface was, which over time degraded, which meant that as the roller coasters got older, they very quickly, you know, became rougher and more unstable and inherently less safe as well. Um, this tubular uh, coaster system really did away with all of that. It, you know, held up better over time. It was smoother, and it also was more thrilling. It allowed higher speeds, faster turns, and obviously it's a smoother ride. Um, and it really paved the way to how coasters were made for decades to come, and it looks like it will be continuing even longer into the future because even new roller coasters use this design most of the time. That's crazy. Yeah. So with these three attractions especially, Bob Gurr, pretty much solidified himself as the go-to guy for designing Disney ride systems. Um, and not only that, but this also was kind of the intro into a new level of entertainment in the park because the three attractions that he came up with, the monorail submarine voyage and the Matterhorn bobsleds were also the first three e-ticket attractions in the park. And this has now become the standard for what, new exciting and top tier technology is at a disney attraction but gur was not done with his impact on the theme park industry just yet uh, in 1964 to 65 the new york world's fair approaches disney um, to create four different attractions uh, and the one that gur is probably most notably or most notably worked on was Ford's Magic Skyway for the Ford Motor Company. Um, we did a, we did a history episode on this too, so if you're interested in this, go back and check that one out. Uh, but the attraction was essentially a ride through attraction where guests would get into Ford motor cars and it would take them through the development of technology over time, and also serve as an advertisement for Ford. Um, and Obviously, because Bob Gurr has now solidified himself as the transportation guy in Imagineering, it made sense for Walt to go to him and have him lead the design of the system. But they ran into an issue uh, quickly. They expected crowd levels at the fair to be very high, and they also knew that the typical loading and unloading process of the vehicles uh, was going to cause more work for the staff working there, uh, create longer wait times, it would also just kind of not feel very futuristic, which is a lot of what the attractions at the World's Fair were going for. So Bob Gurr solves all of this uh, by creating the now famous people mover system, where there's a moving platform that rides alongside the ride vehicle uh, for guests to load into. So it's continuous, there's no stopping, and it's quicker. Uh, you know, it makes for a seamless transition onto the ride and just an overall better guest experience. And obviously, this uh, ride system spawned the Omnimover system, which got used in countless number of attractions throughout Disney Park history. Nice. Um, Gurr actually ended up doing work on all four of the attractions at the World's Fair, too. Um, he led most of the design for Ford's Magic Skyway, but he also did development work on the It's a Small World boat ride system, as well as the Progress Land roting, Rotating Theater, which we all know became Carousel of Progress. But the other funny story that I heard was that he actually had a, uh, a pretty big impact with great moments with Mr. Lincoln. So as he tells the story, he's been working on these other three attractions, and 
uh, another team has been working on the Abraham Lincoln animatronic figure for great moments with Mr. Lincoln. And they've been running into some issues. So Walt comes up to Bob Gurr and said, Hey, we are, um, we've got the face movements going pretty well. We've got the hand movements going pretty well, but we can't really get the body movements down. Um, it just doesn't look good. Something's wrong with the system. Can you come take a look at it? And Bob Gurr is like, Hey, um, I do automobiles and I do ride systems and I do stuff like that. He said, I don't have, I have no idea of how human anatomy works. He's like, you've got Imagineers over there that specialize in that, that that's what they do. And Walt at the time, uh, as he normally was, did not care. <laughs> he basically told Bob Kerr, Hey, that's not how we operate at this company. Um, everybody, like nobody's really experts in their field at this stuff. We're pushing boundaries of technology. So nobody's, nobody's an expert in animatronics because we're making the first animatronics. So come over here, take a look at it and see what you can do. Uh, so these other Imagineers have been working on this, this issue for weeks. And Bob Gurr said he went over there and was looking at the structure that they were using for the Abraham Lincoln body and the animatronic and he said that um, at the time he had actually been working on, uh, in his free time with restoring uh, an old plane. And he said that the, um, like the, the gussets and the, the, the frame system that they were using in this animatronic immediately reminded him of the, the airplane that he was working on restoring. And he said within about two minutes he had looked at it and it just clicked with him. And he had come up with a solution to redo the frame system in order to make the animatronic move more lifelike. And with that, um, he really kind of reinforced Walt's idea of people not having specialties that if you're an Imagineer, your job is to come in, uh, put your best effort forward and find solutions to problems. And it really was, he was not an expert in animatronics. He was not an expert in robotics or human anatomy, but he was able to come in there and very quickly come up with a solution because he was just a problem solver. And I just thought that was a very cool story. Uh, and it also helped him <laughs> uh, complete the quadfecta and work on every single attraction at the World's Fair, which I thought was cool. Yeah, I wonder how many, like, did anybody else work on all of the things at the World, World's Fair? Or is it just him? Because either way, that's that's an impressive feat. But yeah, I feel like I, you don't hear that a lot. I don't either. Um yeah, because, I mean, there was so much going on at the time with such a small team that I would imagine a lot of it was kind of, you know, very sectioned off. You kind of had to because of how much was going on. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so those were some of the, the big notable things I thought that, that Bob Gurr did over his career. But he worked on tons and tons and tons of of other attractions while he was at Disney. Um, he did the Tomorrowland Flying Saucers. He worked on the ride systems for Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, uh, and the Jungle Cruise. And so obviously, <laughs> like he said, if it's on wheels and it moves at Disneyland, he probably worked on it. And that's pretty much accurate. Um, he worked with Disney up until 1981 when he officially retired from the company, but he certainly did not stop working after that. After leaving Disney, he branched off and created his own design company, which he called Gur Designs Inc., which yeah, serves its purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and he continued working on a number of other projects. Uh, he and his team designed the King Kong Encounter animatronic at Universal Studios, which... Anybody that's written that knows that that was a very impressive feat of animatronic technology to massive scale animatronic. Um, he was also approached by the Treasure Island Hotel in Las Vegas. Um, they have a nighttime show that occurs multiple times each night where they sink a pirate ship. So he and his team actually designed the pirate ship that gets sunk, raised up again, and resunk multiple times every night for this show. And 
I think one of the coolest things that I had absolutely no idea on was that he uh, was brought in to help develop the animatronics for the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, as well as 1998 Godzilla. So I thought it was very interesting to see just how widespread his impact was on in different areas, even just outside of the Disney parks. And due to that, in 2004, Gurr was finally inducted as a Disney legend and has received a Main Street window in Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom, which is definitely, definitely well-deserved. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, dude's still kicking it today. He's 89 right now. And if you ever get a chance, like, look up the interviews he does because like i mean he's still so with it i mean he like he's just very very quick-witted like he he's such such a great storyteller and you can definitely tell how walt would have very quickly realized how impactful he would be on the company and hired him but it's really cool i loved doing some research and learning some more about him um you know he was one of the first i would i guess say like one of the like original generation of disney imagineers um but he was also one of the few that wasn't originally with the disney company you know that wasn't an animator uh or somebody else that worked at the studios that walt brought over into imagineering he was one of the first really like technical hire-ons that Walt brought in to do more of the heavy engineering side of the Imagineering role. And I think it was really cool because, I mean, obviously he, you know, he has the, the hardcore industrial design knowledge, but he also came up with some really, really artistic and, you know, design type stuff like with the monorail and everything. And because of that, I really think he is like the, the one Imagineer that really, hits both sides of that like the imagineering side and the engineering side the best and that's why i think he is my favorite imagineer yeah i can definitely see that he like you said it's nice that he was somebody that didn't come specifically from the company to do this and he definitely left his mark in the industry Mm -hmm. definitely so but yeah the um the interview that he did, the Google Talk interview, um, it's long. It's like an hour long, but they there are videos online that have like short kind of highlight snippets of it. And it's just really, if, if you are interested in it, I highly suggest checking that out because it's, it's just very interesting listening to his, like his design perspective at the time and just how that kind of original notion of when he was starting out and because they were doing new, new stuff that you didn't really have a process that you had to be free form and free thinking. And he talks about how he really carried that through and used it in later, later designs and later projects that he was working on was that he, he didn't want to fall into a set design process because that kind of killed creativity and it made it where, you, you know, you're just doing formulaic things that he wanted to keep pushing bounds of technology and just, free think and um you know and create new things and he he just really kept that free form philosophy throughout his whole career at disney and then even beyond that so definitely if you get a chance check it out he's a really 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 cool guy um i mean obviously but uh even just getting to listen to him talk for extended periods of time he's got so many interesting stories to, to tell has such a cool perspective on the whole process and just it's always cool to, to talk to the people that got to work with Walt, like back in the heyday. So, um, yeah, he, he's got tons of cool stories. <laughs> then that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for joining us again on another episode of the Station 71 podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you want to find links to all of our social media, they can be found along with our show notes at www.station71podcast.com. And while you're there, if you have any topics that you want to have us discuss on future episodes, you can send us an email at station71podcast at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed your ride, and we'll see you real soon.